Now we're live. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Lauren Ballard. It is a is an absolute pleasure to be with you this evening. And if you are watching a replay, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is that you are watching. So I am here to, and I want to thank so much, say thank you so much to Alton for having me. I'm here just to really help every single artist, every single creative, take their creative business, take their their passion to the next level. And so we're going to talk about some tax issues, some tax opportunities, some deductions, some tax savings that will really help take your business to the next level. So if you could, I, I think the uh, we have Alton in the, in the background. So if you could launch the slides for me, I'm going to jump right in. So I call this presentation, Fix the Bucket, Managing Your Creative Business's Finances. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am a profitability and growth strategist, also a CPA licensed in New York. I started my career out of college in New York, was living in Brooklyn for about 10 years and now have relocated since to Atlanta, Georgia where I live with my husband. Um, I am passionate with about working with entrepreneurs of color, and I have a company called the Discipling CPA LLC, which is an accounting firm, but we also offer business coaching and consulting. I started my career at Deloitte in 2011, and when I am not helping CEOs and entrepreneurs save money and grow their businesses, I absolutely love hiking. I love reading a good book, drinking some delicious herbal tea, and watching a good documentary. Um, also, a random fact about me, I am a trained plant-based chef. I actually went to culinary school in New York City. The school that I went to is now um, has since evolved and rolled into another culinary school that's in the city. So we're going to jump right in. And a lot of times when I'm talking to entrepreneurs, one of the things that I say is that your business is like a bucket. You can either hold on to your resources and scoop them out as needed, or there your bucket is leaking and it has holes in it. And a lot of times, especially when we do not have certain systems and processes in place in our business, we find that our business is more of a leaky bucket than a bucket that we can actually serve and, and pour out into other people from that outflow. And so the common holes that, that we see, again, lack of systems, overpaying on expenses, undervaluing your time and your services, and not considering taxes. And I would almost say that overpaying on expenses and not considering taxes could be considered one and the same. So definitely similar, but there's also some different nuances. But today we are going to talk about specifically taxes. So when we talk about paying Uncle Sam, and today is actually one of the tax deadlines, if you have an S-Corp or a partnership, then you know that your return was due today unless you extended your return. There are a couple business entities that you kind of need to make sure that you're familiar with. Obviously, we have the solopreneur or, or the sole proprietor. And so that's just you by yourself. You have an you have a business, you are a musician, and you probably have some gigs that you are getting compensation from. You're doing parties, you're doing weddings, you're doing special events. And so you may be functioning like a solo or sole proprietor. And that's one type of business structure that we can say. But then we also have, we take a step up and we have the limited liability corporation or company. And one of the benefits of an LLC is the fact that you, as an individual, can have the opportunity to have a business that is set up, that is separate from you, in the sense that you no longer have to use your social security number. You can get an identification number specifically for your business, and it provides something called limited liability. And what does that mean? So limited liability 
really means that if you were to come into some type of legal or financial issue with your business, there is a separation between your business and you as an individual. And so that is very, very attractive for solopreneurs or sole sole proprietors who want to have that extra level of protection, who don't necessarily want to have all of their personal information made available. Um, But it is an easy entity to set up. You can change the way it's treated for taxes. You can be an S-corp. You can be a corporation. You can keep it as a single member LLC. And that just comes through on your personal tax return on your 1040. But there are some cons to it. So one of the big cons is that it requires additional filings in most states. So I know for most of the viewers, you are either in the New York area in New York City or New York metro area. And so New York is one of those states where you have to file an additional filing if you set up an LLC. Usually it's a nominal fee, but it's still something that you need to make sure that you stay on top of to keep your business current and and up to date in the state. And it can be costly. This is another con for the LLC. It can be costly for tax purposes if not properly monitored. We won't get too deep into this, but there is something called self-employment tax. And basically, when you are a W-2 or an, a W-2 employee, you get uh, t- taxes taken out of your check every two weeks or every week when you get paid. Th- your employer is paying a portion of your self, your employment taxes. But when you now switch from being an employee to self-employed through an LLC, you now have to pick up the slack for those employment taxes. And so you have an additional piece that you have to consider. And depending on how much you're making in your business, it can get costly. And it may make sense for you to make some modifications, some changes to how your business is characterized for tax purposes. But again, that really is just case by case. And you want to make sure that you understand where you're at, you're at financially for your business. But as I said, this is a great option for a solopreneur or a sole proprietor who is looking for limited liability. This class is for artists, but I do want to mention that if you are also, if somebody is involved in real estate, maybe that's something that you'd like to get involved in in the future. LLCs are a great vehicle to look at for developing your real estate business as well. So then the next and this is another entity that a lot of small business owners use. It's an S corporation or an S corp. And so it has the benefit of there's something called double taxation. So when we have a C corp and when and a lot of times when I throw out these, these terminologies, people don't necessarily know what that means, but let's think of Nike. So Nike would be a C corp. It is a corporation that everybody knows you can buy and sell uh, shares of of Nike. It is a public entity that stands on its own. And so anybody who owns a portion of Nike, they have to pay tax on something called dividends that they receive, which is basically a benefit, a payment for uh, as a result of the how well the business is doing. So you'll have to pay taxes on that. But if I owned if I owned Nike and also was the CEO of Nike, I would get taxed on my salary, my income. And then the business itself is also getting taxed on whatever income is generated within the business. And so that the fact that you're getting taxed at multiple levels is what they refer to as double taxation. So with an S corp, you get to avoid that first level of tax at the business level, and you are only taxed as the business owner at the the individual level. The great thing about it is that, again, you don't have that double taxation. It's easy to add new shareholders. Uh, You can take something called tax-free distributions, which basically is when I pull money from the business and I do not have to pay tax on it. There it gets a little hairy though. It gets a little funny when we think about 
how many shareholders. So if we go back to our example of Nike, I can have an unlimited, in theory, amount of shareholders in my corporation. But with S-Corps, you can only have a hundred shareholders and there are specific specific criteria for shareholders in an S-Corp. So you need to be mindful of that, but this is a great option for like a family run business. Um, if you have, if you have a collective of people who um, maybe you have a dance troupe and it's mom, dad, daughter, son, and they all want to come together and build this business and they want to want to grow it, this would be a good option for them. The other thing that you have to consider is that owners working in the business are required to compensate themselves under reasonable compensation rules. And basically what that means is that I can't say I own the business and I work in the business and I'm only paying myself $5,000 a year. I need to make sure that I'm compensating myself a rate that is fair, that if some, if I were to hire somebody from the outside, they would be comfortable with the salary that I'm offering. So you have to make sure that you keep that in mind. And so there's different types of taxes that we have to consider. This was a screenshot that I saw several months ago, and it just lists out all the taxes that that we as individuals and businesses get hit with on a daily basis. But some of the ones that you have to consider as an artist entrepreneur are your federal and state income taxes. If you're in New York City, then you also have the New York City tax that you need to consider. You'll have sales tax. And if you have employees, you have to consider payroll tax as well. So this, I wanted to jump into this as we are talking about this idea of setting up our business for success, making sure that we have systems in place so that we do not have this leaky bucket. And one of the things that I come across time and time again, especially with small business owners, is that we like to say, oh, I made some money in my business, so I'm going to use the money from my business to pay for my personal expenses. But that's not quite how it works. We have to keep an eye out for personal expenses. We have the cookie jar and you see the hand reaching for the cookie, but your business isn't a cookie jar. So make sure to keep your personal expenses outside of your business. If you want to take some money from your business, you can absolutely do that. But you want to make sure that it's clear that you're removing the money from the business for your personal use, but you're not swiping your business debit card um, or your business credit card specifically for personal expenses. So how can you tell the difference between a personal expense and a business expense? You can ask yourself a simple question. Is this expense necessary and reasonable based on my line of work? And I want to say something about this word necessary. So when we say necessary, sometimes people will think that it means required. That doesn't mean necessarily required. It more so is a meaning or alluding to the fact that it makes sense for your line of work. So if I'm a musician and I, let's just say I'm a bass player or I play the piano, would it make sense for me to go to a music shop and buy new strings for my guitar? Absolutely. So that would make sense. Even if maybe there was a, a particular type of string, I don't like steel strings, I prefer nylon strings. So I'm going to buy nylon strings and maybe most people don't think that nylon strings are necessary, but they are necessary for me, for my level, my comfort as while I'm playing. And so that would be a necessary and reasonable expense for my business. What if I, maybe I, I, I'm a dancer, right? And so do I need to, maybe I need to get my costume tailored. The average business might not need to hire a tailor, 
but for your line of work, that may make sense. And so just start to think about, is this necessary and is this reasonable for my line of work? So I have a couple examples here to start kind of making this, this a little bit clearer. And so this first example is a, a little nod to my time in Brooklyn. And it says, you leave a gig at the Children's Museum and decide to stop at Natural Blend on Washington Avenue to get a smoothie. Is this deductible, yes or no? So in this instance, if you live in New York City, so when I lived in New York, I lived in Flatbush. So Washington Avenue was on the way to my house. This would not be considered a business expense. I'm in my I'm in my city, I'm in my neighborhood. I'm not that far. I chose to go get a smoothie, but it wasn't required for me to do my job. But now, let's just say I had to go to Philadelphia to pick up a piece of equipment and I stopped at Reading Terminal for lunch. Is this deductible? Well, now this goes from being a local trip to I actually traveled for work. And while I was traveling, I stopped to get something to eat. This would be deemed a necessary and reasonable business expense that you could absolutely deduct. So we just want to make sure that when we're thinking about these expenses, when we're thinking about deductions, do they make sense? Is this something that's necessary for me to do? Let's do, let's look at another example. Business or personal, you have a van that's your family vehicle. 95% of the time you use it for personal activities. So taking your kids, uh, grocery shopping, doing whatever else you need to do. 5% of the time you use it to transport equipment and supplies to your various gigs. Is this deductible? So this one is almost a trick question that's like, kind of. <laughs> so the 5% of the time that you use it, you can allocate a portion of your vehicle expenses as a deduction for your business. The remaining 95, that's personal and therefore you cannot write it off. So it is still tax season. I know that there were some tax returns that were due today, but we have another round of tax returns that are gonna be due April 18th. And so, if you have not filed yet, either you've extended or you're not required to file until April 18th, this is very, very beneficial for you to think about so that you can maximize at tax time. So the three must-haves are number one, clean financial records. I cannot emphasize this enough. So many times solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, um, one, one man, one woman shows, they will get to tax time, but they struggle to pull together all the documentation that they need. And there's, they question whether or not what they did during the year made sense. But if we can get ahead of this and have clean financial records before we get to tax time, it will make a world of difference. The second thing that you need is a qualified professional who can help, who can file on your behalf. Please do not go to someone who is not comfortable working with small businesses. You will waste time and money trying to undo mistakes working with somebody who does not truly understand what you need as a business owner. And then the last thing that you have to have at tax time is realistic expectations. So already kind of touched on the, the idea of clean financials, but again, I just want to emphasize that it will reduce the amount of time you spend with your accountant or tax preparer if you keep track of your inflows and outflows consistently. Consistently, excuse me. And there are a lot of helpful tools that you can use to do this. You can use QuickBooks. You can use Wave Accounting. You can use Zero. You can use Google Sheet. Um, you can use pen and paper if you are someone who who likes to use pen and paper and you know that you can keep everything 
organized and together, and it's going to be easy for you to give that to your accountant. Whatever makes sense for you based on your business and based on your style, do that, but just make sure that you are consistently tracking your inflows and outflows. So that means your cash in and the cash that's going out. If you're to the point where you can no longer manage this by yourself or you don't feel confident and comfortable doing this alone, I would highly recommend hiring a book a bookkeeper before you get to the end of the year so that you have enough time to work with them to make sure that things are ready and time for you to file your tax return. Even now, if you haven't gotten things ready for your April 18th deadline, there's still plenty of time to find somebody who can work with you and help you get those things in place. Second thing is a qualified professional. Not everyone who does tax preparation has the experience to do the work. Many companies hire people after a 12-week training program. And I don't know about you, but depending on where you're at in your business, I don't think 12 weeks is enough time for me to feel comfortable and confident that the person sitting on the other side of the desk, whether in person or virtually, is going to be able to help me. So make sure that the person that you're working with comes highly recommended and you are you feel comfortable with their level of knowledge and expertise. And be willing to ask your accountant for references about their experience. I know for me and my firm, I always make sure that I'm treating my clients well. And so if a client, a prospective client were to reach out to me and say, hey, Lauren, I would love to get a little bit more insight about how you work. Do you have any clients that I can reach out to? I would be more than happy to do that because I think it's so important when we're talking about finances to make sure that you're working with somebody that you can trust. Then the last thing is having realistic expectations. Tax time, and I know that this is going to hurt some feelings, but tax time is not the time to look for tax savings. If you have not planned on reducing your tax bill throughout the year, you can't be surprised by what you owe. You kind of go in hoping for the best, but expecting the worst. Plan your taxes ahead of time and understand your preparer's timeline. I used to work at some one of the largest accounting firms in New York City. And when it came to tax time, we were just trying to get the returns done. That was not the time that we were talking to our clients, trying to see how we could save them money. That was not the time that we were having meetings and conferences about changes in their businesses. It was just, we've got a deadline, we've got to get the work done, and we've got to make sure it's done well and out the door. And so big or small, your preparer is likely in the similar predicament where they're just trying to get through the work. And it's not that they don't want to help you. It's that time just does not allow. And so if you need some additional support, if you need some additional contact with a professional, then make sure to do that outside of tax season so that you can really get the insight that you need. And let me talk about just a little bit of the benefits of tax planning. Tax planning should happen throughout the year, and we already just discussed that. But it's also an opportunity to ma map out your financial goals and business growth with a, a qualified professional. One of the things that I notice with my clients is that they have lofty goals, but they don't know how to get there. But if we could sit down and, and map out a plan, it becomes it becomes much easier to say, okay, six months from now, a year from now, I want to make 5000 a month extra, or I want to make 10000 extra a month. And we can really start to put that, put that together and also talk about what are the tax implications of that increase in revenue. And it's also your advisor's job to stay current with changes in tax law. And when they are staying current and you have this time on their calendar, they can help you take advantage of new tax breaks and incentives so that you are, again, saving uh, at tax time as opposed to being at the mercy of the forms. So this is a list, and this is definitely not an all-encompassing list, 
by, by any stretch of the imagination. But this is a list here of some of the deductions that I think are really good to keep in mind. And we'll just go through them and I kind of give some additional information about each one. And so advertising. So if you're doing Facebook advertising, maybe you, you're a musician and you want to get more gigs or you are a dancer, an artist, you can run Facebook ads, you can run Instagram ads, and that is deductible. If you're buying books, um, music theory, it could be about marketing. It could be about anything related to your business that's deductible. Boxes and packages, we're just jumping down the list. If you have merchandise, um, apparel that you sell, if you, whatever packaging that you need to, to ship that out or provide that to your customers, that's deductible. Classes in personal development, if you want to learn a new skill or a style, that would be deductible cleaning and maintenance for instruments and equipment, clothing. Again, we talked about alterations for, for specialty costumes. So that could be deductible. If you are purchasing outright gear and equipment, that can be deductible. Web domains. If you have a personal website, a personal brand, all of that is deductible. We talked about training. Um, if you have a home office or a home studio practice space, that space can be used as a, a tax deduction. Meals are deductible if you are um, traveling for a gig um, or an event. Internet access, travel, your cell phone bill. Um, if you have a, a, a cell phone specifically for business and then it's 100% deductible, if you're using your personal phone for business, then you can de deduct a portion. Um, production costs. So practice space, studio time, engineers, props, all of that is deductible. Storage, if you need to store equipment, store store costumes, store instruments, all of that is deductible. And then the last one we'll touch on is the vehicle expenses. So that, we again, we spoke about that a little bit earlier with the example, but that is also deductible. This is a book here that I really recommend. Um, it is called 475 Tax Deductions for Businesses and Self-Employed Individuals. And so I really like this, this book. I think it's excellent. I don't think that it's been updated since maybe 2019, but it's still pretty current. There hasn't been any major, major changes in tax legislation. Um, obviously, we got some some changes because of the COVID relief, but generally speaking, most of what's in there, if not all of it, is still very much relevant. And so I'd highly recommend that you purchase that book and add it to your arsenal. That will help you be more knowledgeable when you go speak to your tax professional and, and make sure that you're kind of keeping track of, of what you're doing and, and if these things are actually business expenses. The last thing that I want to mention uh, before we see if there are any questions is make sure you keep your receipts. Obviously, receipts are frustrating. We don't necessarily want to keep them, but you can scan them. You can copy them, take pictures of them. Find a way to make sure that you're documenting purchases. Um, I know larger companies, they kind of set a threshold. So maybe you say below $25, I'm not going to keep it. But above $25, I'm going to make sure I have the documentation to support it. And so I, I would say, again, you can use several methods. I know that QuickBooks has a receipt function. You can use something like a Google Drive and take pictures, as I said, and, and upload those files there. But make sure that you are keeping your receipts. If you need to contact me, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, you can uh, contact me on my website or at my email, which is lauren at the disciplingcpa.com. And my website is www.thediscipling.cpa.com. So now I want to open it up. I know that I was chatting, um, and this is this is some heavy information. And so I want to make sure that I give opportunity for questions if there's any questions that came through on the chat. Awesome. 
Well, if there are no questions, I want to thank you all for your time and for your cooperation. Again, if there's any questions that come up later on, feel free to reach out to me and I will be more than happy to, to answer any questions. Um, and I want to thank Alton once again for the invitation just to serve this community. It is truly awesome what the work that you guys do. And so thank you so much. And until next time, bye.